Good evening, everyone, and a huge welcome here to this completely wonderful gallery room at Kew. I hope you've all had a chance to look at the amazing botanical art that's on the walls and indeed is sort of all around us. Um, I'm Rosie Boycott, and I come with 5 by 15, and it's an absolute delight to do projects with Kew, which is just one of the most amazing institutions we have in our country, indeed in the world. Uh, Amitav and I have been lucky enough to have had a tour around some of Kew's treasures, and we've been looking at uh, old opium pipes and bowls and all sorts of extraordinary things. And the largest uh, opium pods, which are honestly are like the size of a double hen's egg, uh, that even Amitav says he's never seen anything like that before. So this place really is full of extraordinary things. I want to say a very big thank you to Rathbone's Investment Management, who make, has made this series possible, and indeed all our environmental work that 5x15 does has been so wonderfully supported by Louise, who's here in the front row. And it's great that we can all do this tonight. So. The format of the evening uh, is pretty simple. I'm going to first of all introduce Alex Antonelli, who's the head of science at Kew. He's going to say a few words, and then I'm going to hand over to Amitav, who's going to talk us through what the significance was of China and colonialism in terms of literally what's here in Kew and around us and how plants moved around the world. He's got some fantastic slides to show you, so it's going to be a treat. And then when he's done that, he and I are going to talk more specifically about his amazing new book, which I cannot recommend too highly. It is a fantastic story of skullduggery, uh, the Medellin cartel really starting off in the British Raj in Calcutta, um, all sorts of things that I think our history, our British history, and in the sort of history I learned in school has really tried to bury quite successfully. Anyway, enough of that. Alex, over to you to introduce Q and all of us. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests and fellow enthusiasts of the Natural World, uh, it's absolutely amazing to welcome you here to this evening where uh, botany meets uh, literature. And it is uh, fantastic to be talking to you. As Director of Science, I have the pleasure of leading the work of over 500 scientists working in more than 100 countries. And it is a very special evening for us because Kew Gardens has always been at the forefront of understanding and protecting biodiversity and uh, also fostering conversations around the natural world and literature and history is an integral part of that. And last year, we were fortunate to co-create two seasons of 5 by 15 and um, it's also a great opportunity to bring in inspiring speakers who can share their stories and engage in conversations that go beyond the scientific community. And last year, uh, over 1,200 people uh, attended and watched uh, the events online and uh, another 8,800 people watched uh, the talks on YouTube and also on the 5 by 15 uh, SoundCloud podcast, which I'm sure you all be aware, with, um, aware of. And tonight's event, uh, as Rosie said, is uh, on uh, Amitov's uh, wonderful book, The Smoke and Ashes, and it's going to be a really fascinating journey through time in nature, exploring the intersections of literature, botany and the human experience. And it's also a profound reflection about uh, the long-standing uh, relationship between humans and plants. And that's also something that we are very fascinated about because we are discovering new stories uh, as we explore our amazing collections and some of those we just explored before uh, this evening. Um, and um, I think that we also are very acutely aware of the legacy that our collections have. So at the same time as we are um, engaging the, those conversations. We also have an internal journey at Q where we are really keen to uh, unearth some of those conversations and the, the stories behind uh, the specimens of eight and a half million uh, different plants and fungi that our collections hold and how we can enrich the experiences of our visitors who come to Kew Gardens uh, to learn more about plants and the important work we do around conservation. So uh, just before I hand over, I just want to express my uh, gratitude to Baroness uh, Rosie Boycott, and we've had the pleasure of uh, co-sharing a uh, stage back in 2020 that was in, uh, in a very hot uh, Colombia in Cartagena, <laughs> the Hay Festival, and since then several other events as well, so it's been a, a tremendous pleasure to work with you, uh, Rosie, and she's the founder of the 50, 5 by 15 and the host for this evening as well, and she no doubt expertly guide us through this conversation with Mr. Gosh. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to, back to you, 
and uh, listen to the story around uh, smoke and ashes. So thanks so much for uh, being here, and I hope you all enjoy this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, it's all entirely reciprocated. It's a, it's a joy to do things with you, Alex. Um, so, Amitav. Um, everyone knows, I think, who Amitav is. He's, uh, the first book of his I read was The Sea of Poppies, which took me into the trilogy. Then I read every single thing he'd written, uh, except one book which he gave me today, which I still have in store. Um, but it, we have, as I say, we've, we've got Smoke and Ashes, as well as uh, The Nutmeg Curse on Sale Outside, and Amitav will be signing. So I'm going to pass over to you. Welcome here. Thank you so much. I think I'm going to stand up for this, for this little bit, because it'll make it easier for me to... Well, I've had a really exciting day, because I've had two tours, one of the House of Lords, where I had lunch <laughs> with Rosie, and that was really exciting. And we even watched a bit of a debate. And then I had this incredible tour of, uh, you know, the opium collections in, uh, in Kew Gardens, and that's been very exciting. So uh, I'm just going to show you a few, uh, a few slides because, you know, yesterday I was, uh, I was at Toppings in Bath, and I started showing them the slides. And then I thought uh, maybe 10 minutes had passed, and it was actually like 40 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so I can just hold forth forever about this. Uh, but I do think that one of the distinctions of my book, Smoke and Ashes, is that it's the only short book about opium that exists. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not that short. It's like two <laughs> but this is an inexhaustible topic, and you can just go on about it forever. Uh, so I'm going to leave out the bit where I explain to you how the Dutch became the first uh, imperial narco-state, and then Britain became an even better narco-state the British Empire, I mean. And I'm just going to start uh, with the botanical exchanges. So uh, is, is, the, uh, is my presentation queued? Yes. So I just, I just have to do this, right? Yeah. Ah, no. Uh, so, so, uh, so, sorry, I'm, I'm just going to go through this very, very quickly so that uh, this, is all the, <laughs> this is all the stuff I'll... Uh, but you might like to see this one. <laughs> Uh, this is the this, uh, this is the, the the Ghazipur Opium Factory, founded in the uh, 1780s, and it still exists, and is you know continues to produce opium. Anyway, so I'll go through the rest as quick as I can. You're going to miss all the nice uh, pictures. Uh, but anyway, so here is where I'm going to begin. Because this is where the great botanical exchanges uh, with, uh, between China and Britain started. So this is the city of Guangzhou, uh, for which the Anglis was uh, Canton. Uh, it, it was actually a Portuguese word, uh, because the Portuguese were the first there. So, uh, you know, this is, a, I don't know, have any of you been to Guangzhou? Uh, it's just, ah, there you are. It's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful city, I'm completely enchanting. I mean, I still find it absolutely enchanting. But Guangzhou, what was very special about it uh, in, the, in the period before, between, let's say, the early 18th century and uh, 1841, 42, is that it was the only place in China where foreign merchants could reside. And all the trade that was done with China was done through Guangzhou. And the foreign merchants lived in a tiny little enclave that is, uh, uh, it was just about a hundred meters, uh, 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 yeah. So, see this is what, uh, so uh, you see these two walls that are running through. On this, on this map you can see the, how the walls, uh, you know, this is the outer wall, that's the inner wall. It's a, you know, Guangzhou is a very ancient city, it's older than Beijing. Uh, so. So this is the foreign enclave in Guangzhou. It's, uh, it, it doesn't exist. It, it was burnt down during the first Opium War and was never really rebuilt. Uh, but uh, uh, these are the 13 factories they were called. There was an English factory which was there. That was the East India Company factory. It was the biggest. This is the Dutch factory. There was a Spanish factory, a Danish factory, an American factory, and so on. So a factory really derives from the word fattoria, uh, uh, again in Portuguese. It doesn't mean that anything was manufactured there. They just lived there. And this, I love this. It's, uh, it's uh, painted ivory. 
so here you can see the, uh, the foreign enclave and all the surroundings. And that's the city, uh, those are the city walls in the distance. And uh, uh, here, uh, this is a painting by William Daniel. Uh, he's a, uh, he was a very well-known uh, British artist, again, of the factory. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So, you know, uh, uh, in order to get to the factories, you had to go across the floating city, which is the first thing that, ev that everyone uh, remarked on, uh, you know, when they were talking about, uh, when they were talking about Guangzhou, that half the city was afloat like this. Uh, this is the interior uh, of, uh, of the 13 factories. Here again, it's a, there, there's a picture of... Um, so, uh, you know, all kinds of merchants uh, are congregated over there. Among them, you know, very... Un I mean, the American merchants uh, were particularly uh, important because they, uh, you know, you've heard of the term Boston Brahmins? Uh, so, Almost all the Boston Brahmins, their families were basically opium traders. Their money came from opium, really. All of them um, really um, lodges and so on. Uh, but very interesting was this Warren Delano Jr. He was one of the biggest uh, opium traders uh, of the 19th century. He was Franklin Delano Roosevelt's um, uh, grandfather. And all the Roosevelt money actually came from opium, uh, you know. So. You know, just just uh, something to point out because uh, Robert Bennett Forbes, uh, you know, the Forbes name is uh, iconic of capitalism, you know, like Forbes magazine and so on. Uh, well, he was one of the biggest opium traders in, uh, in Canton. Uh, and he actually put all his money into American uh, railroads. So, you know, that's why... Uh, But here we have Sir Joseph Banks, you know, first curator of Kew Gardens. He was really the founder of Kew Gardens. Uh, he understood very early on uh, that China was a treasure house of, uh, of botany, you know. And this made China very different from other places in the world because uh, John Reeves was one of the merchants that, uh, he, uh, uh, who collected plants for Sir Joseph Banks in, uh, in Guangzhou. The reason that, uh, you know, Sir Joseph Banks and other English collectors knew this about, uh, about Chinese uh, plants is because, actually, uh, uh, Guangzhou was also a great center for the arts. It had these huge uh, studios uh, which created artworks of many, many different kinds, including, uh, so one of them, <laughs> the, um, uh, one of the uh, artists of, uh, of uh, Guangzhou was a man called Chitkwa, and Chitkwa is actually in this famous uh, 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 painting by Zoffany. Uh, can any, can any of, actually, the detail is not good enough uh, here to see, but that's Chitkwa back there. Uh, he, he came here in the 1760s and was received at Buckingham Palace and everything, and you know, he had a very grand reception in, uh, uh, in England. This was another great Chinese artist, Lam Kwa. Uh, so the reason that uh, you know, ch uh, Chinese botany was known uh, to, uh, to Westerners is because they created incredible botanical paintings. And the, you know, basically, as you know, you have a great tradition of botanical paintings in, uh, uh, in Europe. But basically, they were very much influenced by Chinese botanical paintings. So the Chinese drew, uh, they had a very good tradition of botanical paintings as well as uh, zoological paintings. So this is, uh, uh, this is a very early uh, painting by a Chinese artist. Uh, this is another one. Tree peonies, hydrangeas, which, so in effect, uh, really almost, I, I would say pretty much half uh, your garden plants are come from China, uh, uh, really. And hydrangeas, which you always think of as being so English, were actually <laughs> taken from China. And uh, so they also had these uh, zoological paintings. I love this one. Uh, and here, so Joseph Banks, of course, as you know, he sailed around the world on Captain Cook's uh, first expedition. 
he advised the king and you know uh, he set up uh, uh, Kew Gardens but uh, and so <coughs> Uh, Joseph Banks sent out a lot of young gardeners uh, to, uh, to Guangzhou. Uh, you have to understand that this was a very curious circumstance for European collectors because usually European collectors in the 18th, uh, 17th centuries, they would go to places and, you know, they would roam about and uh, pick plants as they liked and bring them back or, you know, uh, I mean, they, they felt completely free to do that. They often created incredible mayhem. I mean, like Alfred Wallace, in one day, he shot, uh, I think it was like 25 orangutans, you know? <laughs> I mean, he was a really strange character in the sense that uh, animals hated him. I mean, he says this in his, <laughs> in his book. <laughs> you know? Uh, he had, fortunately for him, a Malay helper uh, who... Uh, he would give all the animals too, but the animals hated him. Once he stepped off in a Malay island and the buffalo came charging at him at the moment they saw him. So I don't know, they picked up something. But anyway, so William Kerr was one of Joseph Banks' most successful plant collectors. You know, he was a gardener, you know, he was a working class Englishman. So he turns up in Guangzhou, he goes to the foreign enclave, there are all these ultra-wealthy, ultra uh, you know, English uh, um, uh, drug dealers uh, over there, <laughs> living it up. Uh, so he, <laughs> a poor fellow, uh, he takes to drink, and he becomes really kind of uh, sad and depressed, and finally he manages to leave Guangzhou and he goes to Sri Lanka, uh, you know, to the Candy Botanical Gardens where he died of a broken heart or whatever. But he sent, uh, he sent uh, a young Chinese uh, um, a curator with one of his collections because in those days, at this particular point in time, the early 1830s, uh, the, uh, the plants had to be brought back on a ship, which was a dangerous thing. I mean, you know, salt water would get in and so on. So it was, it was not an easy thing uh, to send. So you had to send someone with it. And he sent this Chinese curator who made a huge impression in Kew Gardens, you know. Uh, it's a very interesting story. It's in my book, River of Smoke, if you ever feel interested. Uh, then this thing was invented, which is called the Wardian case. Uh, I somehow meant to ask uh, my guides today if I could see a Wardian case, but I, I forgot. Uh, but, uh, so you must have many examples of Wardian cases, right? So after the invention of the Wardian case, uh, you know, uh, plants were sent back in the Wardian case. Uh, and the Wardian cases were uh, used until the 1960s. Do you still use them? No. Ah, okay. Uh, uh, so, I love this book. I don't know if you have it. I'm sure you have it in your bookshop. Uh, Jane Kilpatrick's book, uh, Gifts from the Gardens of China. So you can see some, uh, I'll, I'll just show you a few. This is uh, the Chinese uh, rose. And the reason that you have repeat flowering roses is basically because uh, the Chinese uh, developed uh, varieties of repeat flowering roses. And, um, you know, they were incredibly skilled gardeners. They, uh, this is the Camellia japonica. And uh, this is uh, another uh, dwarf variety. And wisteria. This is, the, this is the one I really love. I love Wisteria, and the city for Wisteria is Venice. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, especially May, June, you walk along the canals, and there are these wonderful waterfalls of Wisteria. And it's extraordinary to think that they all came from China. Not only from China, they came from Guangzhou. Equally interesting is the whole history. I mean, not only did uh, China send all these, um, uh, all these amazing flowers, uh, essentially, the whole notion of the English garden uh, really comes from China. Uh, anyway, uh, you know, that's a long history and I don't want to get into it right now. So, I'll, we'll just carry on having a conversation. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's fantastic. Um, Yes, and I like, I like the fact that we got the willow tree, of course, and that's become yes. also, over, a, over the village duck pond, a willow tree seems to be ultimately about an English village, but in fact, of yes. course, it's very Chinese. So, you started off showing us the pictures of Guangzhou. I mean, why, how did Guangzhou become part of a sort of outpost, almost, of the British Empire in that moment? Well, uh, well, the sort of prehistory of this 
is that the British Empire was heavily dependent financially on the taxes on tea, uh, the, East, the, the taxes on tea that were take, uh, uh, carried back to Britain by the East India Company. Uh, that was one of the largest sources of revenue for, the Brit uh, uh, for, for Britain. You know, I mean, that's why they had a complete monopoly on tea, even the sale of tea in America. And as you know, that led to the Boston Tea Party and so on. Uh, so uh, all the tea that came into uh, Britain was exported uh, through, uh, through Guangzhou. So Guangzhou in this period wasn't really an outpost of the British Empire. What was really remarkable about Guangzhou in the pre-1842 uh, period is that this was the only place in the world where you had a kind of genuine cosmopolitanism. You know, a cosmopolitanism that was not overseen by Europeans, mm -hmm. but was overseen by the Chinese. So this was a place where Indians and, uh, you know, others uh, mixed uh, quite freely, you know, with Americans, with, uh, with British people and so on. In fact, the single largest group of people in the foreign enclave were probably Indians. So this had a revolutionary effect uh, on world commerce. Uh, the, the Indians who were uh, in Guangzhou were mainly Parsis, who then became these uh, great pioneers of Indian industry. As you know today, uh, the largest employer in Britain is a Parsi, uh, is a Parsi company, yes. And this company started uh, in China. But, but did, did that company start on opium as well? Uh, it wasn't exclusively opium, but yeah, certainly uh, they started, you know, opium was the single largest commodity. You couldn't be a trader in, 19, uh, in the 19th century in India if you weren't trading in opium. It was impossible. Opium was the most lucrative commodity in the British Empire. I mean, it really undergirded the entire colonial economy. So, uh, when I said at the beginning, it, it feels like a guilty part of our history. I mean, we don't get taught this at school. We get taught that the East India Company was this magnificent um, creation and that it went out and it brought roads and railways to India and how wonderful it was. And it wasn't really until reading your books you start to see another side. But how did, how did opium develop in India at that time? How did the British turn it from something that was has grown and used a bit into this mighty crop. And as you say, you call it actually the birth of capitalism, what happened with opium. So uh, that's the sort of prehistory again. Uh, what happened is that, uh, you know, the opium is the most miraculous medicinal substance known to man. I mean, uh, it's, it, ha it has all these incredible properties. Uh, it can help you suppress coughs. Uh, it can help you, uh, you know, uh, control diarrhea, for example. And it's the most incredible anesthetic. And opium uh, has existed with humanity going back, uh, you know, 10,000 years. I mean, the oldest examples of opium that have been found are six to 7,000 years. And so, which means that it was cultivated for long before that because uh, uh, the opium poppy uh, is not, uh, doesn't exist naturally. Uh, you know, it doesn't exist in nature. It was developed by humans. Uh, so going back, uh, you know, uh, at least uh, 8,000 years, the opium poppy was developed by humans because humans started using it, uh, using it for its medicinal properties. It's a completely miraculous circumstance, uh, a miracle, mir mir miraculous substance. Even today, opium is, has so many medicinal uses that it can never be banned as such. Because uh, has anyone here ever uh, taken uh, an anti-diarrheal like Imodium or something? Mm -hmm. Well, if you have, that's, that's opium. If you've taken uh, a cough syrup uh, like Corex or something, that's opium too. And certainly if you've ever, uh, if you've ever had an operation and uh, you know, been given some sort of anesthetic, uh, that's opium, I mean, <laughs> you know, uh, I, I don't know how many of you have had uh, colonoscopies, but it's a ghastly experience, generally <laughs> speaking. But I remember I woke from my colonoscopy uh, feeling kind of exhilarated. <laughs> you know, I wanted to go dancing out of there. And I suddenly realized, yeah, they've given me an opiate, <laughs> you know. So it's a, it's, a, it's a really miraculous substance. And if it's used so much today, you can imagine 
how important it was, uh, historically speaking, when there were very few medicinal substances. So, in fact, a trade in medicinal opium existed really from before antiquity, you know. Uh, uh, so, a small trade in medicinal opium has always existed. Mm -hmm. And one of the places where medicinal opium was grown was uh, the region of Bihar today. So, uh, Bihar, this part of Bihar fell into the hands of the British Empire after the Battle of Baksar in 1763. And they almost immediately declared uh, a monopoly on the opium trade. Now, they had been learning from uh, their uh, frenemies, uh, you know, the, uh, the Dutch Empire. The Dutch Empire had really been the pioneers in using opium as a trade, as a trade commodity in their conquest of uh, the Dutch East Indies. And uh, so the British had learned from them. And uh, uh, at this particular point in time, they were facing a very difficult situation because they, uh, they were very dependent on tea, but they had to pay for tea in silver. And uh, there, was a, uh, there was a sort of shortage of silver in the middle 18th century, so that they couldn't uh, trade so much tea. Uh, they didn't have access to so much silver. So what happened then is that they decided to follow the Dutch model, and they decided that they would start exporting opium to China. So the first, uh, the first shipments of opium that they sent were in the 1770s. And, you know, they were small shipments, they didn't, uh, they, um, they didn't sell very much. But then they, uh, you know, it caught on because uh, they, you know, uh, European empires had a long experience of dealing with addi addictive substances like, um, uh, you know, rum, tobacco, uh, sugar and so on. So they knew that they could grow, you know, that they could grow the market. And sure enough, the market grew like wildfire. And uh, soon, uh, you know, before that, uh, th they were facing a balance of payments problem with China. Uh, within a couple of decades, uh, that was completely reversed. Uh, uh, silver was pouring out of China. It became a great sort of fiscal problem for them, as well as a public health problem. But the Chinese didn't actually want it, did they? I mean, the Chinese rulers could see that this influx of opium was pretty devastating. Absolutely. But they actually banned opium as early as 1729. Um, and they reiterated the ban several times. Uh, it was a completely illicit trade. Did uh, we know that? Did the, did the, of course. Yes, okay. Just, just, just wanted to be clear. <laughs> they, they knew that very well. And in fact, when the, uh, when the East India Company's directors in, uh, in India first proposed trading in opium, they got a very stern letter from... Uh, uh, from London saying, no, no, you know, this is dishonorable, we don't want to do that. But then sure enough, as always happens, you know, the, the profit motive wins. So they started uh, trading in opium on this uh, incredibly large scale. And, you know, if you look at the figures, I actually had some, uh, I had some, some of the graphs up. Uh, they, uh, they grow the opium trade almost exponentially, you know, and which means also that they, they, so in the 1760s, after they conquer Bihar, they create something called the Opium Department, you know, which is like a kingdom within an empire. So the entire Gangetic Plain passes into the control uh, of the British Empire, and they really cre create this almost this draconian plantation system, you know, where uh, where you know British officers have uh, absolutely complete uh, totalitarian powers, you know, to, uh, of enforcement. So uh, the, the poor peasants who are producing this opium are actually producing it below cost. You know, I mean, it's a, it's a really, it's a genuinely ghastly story. Yes, yeah, so you had the opium agents, because you have a lot of descriptions of how, how grand they became as an opium agent. And it, so when you were back in, you know, when you were employed by the East India Company, was it known that you were called an opium agent? Oh, yes, were absolutely. You proud, were you proud of that? Yes, yes. I mean, uh, you, know, uh, you know, the opium agent was like the, one of the kings of the system. Uh, but below him were sub-agents and deputy sub-agents and so on. And uh, the most famous deputy sub-agent or whatever uh, was uh, George Orwell's father. Mm. Uh, George Orwell was born in an opium bungalow um, in a 
little village called Motihari in uh, in Bihar. So the, one of the many curious things that happen is is that the British are operating out of Calcutta, and it's very strongly controlled. But the Indians themselves start to see there's a lot of money to be made here, and they operate out of Western India. That's right. And so the the kind of makeup of um, I mean, you talk about Mumbai going from being uh, Bombay going from being Manchester at one point to becoming Medellin, <laughs> yes. which I thought was a great, great comparison. So, what happened to all the the Indian people who were the, the Parsis who were also getting in on this trade? Um, I should say, first of all, it wasn't just Parsis. What happened is that the British had absolute political control of Eastern India, so they were able to declare a monopoly on opium, and they, they, they were able to enforce a monopolistic system of cultivation uh, in Eastern India. But this was not possible in Western India, where there were some very powerful uh, indigenous uh, states, you know, kingdoms and so on, especially the kingdom of the Sindhyas based in Gwalior, uh, they managed to fight off the British for a very long time. And the British were never able to completely subdue them, even though they tried very, very hard. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, the Duke of Wellington's brother was, be, became an um, you know, opium advisor uh, uh, in that region. And they tried to establish a monopoly, but they weren't able to. So the way that the opium economy in Western India grew was completely different from the way that it grew in Eastern India. Uh, in Western India, it, uh, you know, the people who were involved in the in the growth of this economy were all indigenous. Uh, you know, including the merchants, the wholesalers, even the peasants who were growing opium. In Western India, they were growing it, uh, you know, much uh, much more profitably for themselves than in Eastern India. Where in Eastern India they were producing it uh, below cost. In Western India, they were earning quite rich rewards. So uh, the opium crop in Western India led uh, to the creation of an, um, a very large amount of capital. It also meant that you know uh, merchants from Western India could travel to China, uh, and they could travel to Guangzhou. So they learned all kinds of things. Um, you know, they learned. About, it's, it was the same with the Americans. I mean, these young American merchants who came out to Guangzhou, uh, they also, uh, you know, apart from making a lot of money. They learned about uh, you know, the new industries that were arising because of the Industrial Revolution. They learned about systems of credit. They learned about uh, currency exchanges and so on. So uh, the Parsi merchants who were in, uh, uh, who were in Guangzhou, they became uh, the uh, absolute pioneers of, uh, of Indian industry. Yes, it's, it, I mean, one of the many astonishing things about your book, I mean, you reeled off some of the names of the Boston Brahmins, is this sense of how many huge very, very financially successful big families in the world today had their origins in this particular trade. But in, in your book, The Nutmeg's Curse, you know, you, you talk about the fact that when the Dutch took over the Nutmeg Islands and decided that they would try to own a living thing, own the trade, that somehow this, this tipped the world into the notion that the accepted way of doing things was Northern European male rich. And that that sentiment was able to justify selling opium to China, and indeed justify all sorts of other things. Can you can you elaborate a bit on that? Because it's it's so relevant to today as well. So uh, what happened uh, with the nutmeg trade, uh, which is something I've described at great length in my book, The Nutmeg's Curse is that the nutmeg uh, was an incredibly valuable uh, commodity. You know. Uh, uh, a handful of nutmegs uh, in the uh, 16th century could buy you a house in Amsterdam. It could buy you a, a ship. So, wow. uh, uh, you know, and the nutmeg is endemic to a tiny archipelago, so small that you can't even really see them on a map. It's called the Banda archip Archipelago. It's in the Malaccas, now the uh, province of Maluku uh, in Indonesia. It's actually closer to Australia than to, um, than to let's say, Java. Uh, so this tiny, tiny place was growing this incredibly rich uh, resource or you know, a commodity, though they didn't see it as a resource or a commodity. It was a part of their lives, you know. I mean, it was. So the Bandanese became very skilled uh, uh, entrepreneurs. You know, they, they they were sailors, they were merchants, and so on. But as soon as the Europeans entered this uh, this part of the Indian Ocean, they wanted to establish monopolies. 
you know, on all kinds of trade goods. So they wanted to establish a monopoly on, uh, on nutmeg and on cloves, which were also endemic to these islands, but to another set of islands in the north. So what they did, uh, it, you know, the Dutch were particularly ruthless. Uh, you know, from 1600 onwards, uh, they tried to impose a monopoly on opium. They forced these treaties on the Bandanese. And the Bandanese resisted, you know, it was their, this was, uh, as it were, their familiar, the nutmeg tree was their familiar, which had gui guided them through history and so on. So they resisted. So in 1621, the Dutch governor general, a man called Jan Peterson Kuhn, uh, took, uh, um, uh, took a large fleet uh, and went to the Banda Islands and essentially exterminated the Bandanese. Uh, about one third were just killed. Uh, another third were driven into the mountains where they perished of disease and so on. Another third were enslaved and uh, sent away from the islands. A few hundred managed to escape so, and, uh, you know, to other surrounding islands where they kept um, uh, the, Ban uh, the Bandanese language and customs uh, alive. And they're still alive to this day. That's the weird thing about exterminations. They never actually succeed. Mm -hmm. A few get away. <laughs> you know, because uh, at this, they were doing this because, you know, at this point, the Dutch Empire had two poles. Uh, one was the Banda Islands, the first, uh, uh, the, uh, the first and most important Dutch colony was actually in Ambon, Amboina, which some of you will remember from the massacre of Amboina, so-called massacre of Amboina. But the other end of the Dutch uh, Empire uh, is in uh, what's called, uh, you know, New Amsterdam, that is New York, where I live, Brooklyn. Uh, you know, uh, so it's in Connecticut. And in Connecticut in this period, uh, the English settlers and the English and Dutch, uh, you know, they had fought in the Thirty Years' War together. A lot of the most vicious English settlers actually had, uh, uh, you know, learnt their martial skills uh, in Holland, uh, you know. So at this, at this point in time, uh, the English settlers in Connecticut were busy exterminating the Pequot, you know, and they exterminated them to the point where they actually abolished the name of the tribe. But again, a few got away. And today the Pequot are one of the richest uh, ind indigenous tribes in America. You know, uh, they have all those incredibly um, um, lucrative casinos in Connecticut. So that also happens. But uh, anyway, so they killed off the Bandanese. They seized hold of the, um, uh, of the Banda Islands. They divided them up into plantations. They handed the plantations to uh, basically white settlers, white planters, and they undertook to provide the planters with slaves, uh, uh, and they continued to provide them with slaves for 200 years, you know. Uh, and the slaves mainly came from India. So, you know, what they created was essentially this same pattern of uh, what you might call um, racial capitalism, if you like. And that's the curious thing, because the Dutch VOC was one of the pioneers of uh, the whole capitalist uh, project. So that's what you see. You have the transformation of the products of the earth into commodities and resources, which are measured only in terms of profit. And that's what happens also with opium. But what, what also happened with the opium, and I think, as I think you write about in both books, is that the the kind of this culture, this idea that the Western male, etc., is the right person, is that then you absolve your conscience when you do kill a, a Native American tribe, or you allow vast numbers of Chinese people to get addicted, and you justify it by saying they're lesser people, they're stupid, it's not our fault, it, this is, you know, you somehow establish your sense of superiority, which we see today in the way that we deal with the earth. Uh, yeah, it's absolutely that. I mean, it's this whole process of uh, uh, declaring all those people to be, uh, you know, not quite human. So the crucial term in that is brute. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, so yeah. even as Linnaeus is creating this whole sort of classification of uh, homo sapiens, he also says, yes, we are a species, but this species has four gradations. Um, you know, four, six, eight, or whatever. 
of course, I, I, right at the top, uh, you know, <laughs> of this pyramid, uh, white elite uh, European uh, males. Men. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Because you know, the women are not considered quite uh, so advanced. And certainly, uh, poor white peasants are not also considered quite so advanced. But uh, essentially, in this period, what happens is that uh, you know European uh, elite men come to be convinced that they have this absolute right over everything that exists on this earth, you know, and they begin to assert that right more and more aggressively. I'm going to open it up for questions in a minute, but you you take your book through to um, today. Uh, in terms of how the Sackler company behaved, and, and you make, um, you, you, you use, I'm not sure at what point in the book that this phrase appears, but it is, um, you don't follow the market, you go out and make the market. And that was absolutely a line of Mr. Sackler Senior when he thought about marketing things like OxyContin and how you advertised it. And do you see the same pattern that goes through in that and the same with, I mean, the, the money that the Dutch made became Royal Shell Oil Company, didn't it? It's the same impulse of extraction, ownership, monopoly. Uh, yes, it's absolutely that. And that's the curious thing because, you know, this is exactly the period when Adam Smith and David Ricardo yes. are, are, are formulating their uh, laws of supply and demand and so on and the, and the whole idea of free trade. And in fact, the merchants who are, or actually the British Empire, its insistence on that China keep its market, markets open to opium when the Chinese were trying to ban opium uh, became that uh, you can't do that because it's against the laws of free trade. Mm -hmm. And the laws of free trade are like the laws of God. And you have no right uh, you know, to ban a substance uh, because you think it's not right. So this became the rationale for launching the, uh, uh, launching the first opium war and the second opium war. But the curious thing about it really is that, uh, you know, the laws of supply and demand may apply to some commodities, but it doesn't apply to addictive substances. You know, addictive substances create their own markets. Yes. And uh, that's the curious contradiction that lies at the heart of capitalism itself. You know, that, uh, uh, you know, create this whole system of so-called equilibrium between supply and demand, but that has never existed. You know, the substance that brings this whole, uh, uh, this whole structure into being is an addictive substance. Similarly, uh, you know, the Sacklers understood this perfectly well. They said, uh, uh, you know, uh, you, don't, uh, you don't chase a market, you create a market. So they introduced uh, OxyContin in 1993. Until then, America had no uh, mm -hmm. immediate uh, opioid crisis. In six years, it became one of the most severe uh, health hazards uh, in the United States. And you have that here now. Uh, you know, uh, and you know, the scale of the of the opioid uh, of the drug crisis that you have here is, I think, not properly appreciated. You know, I was doing a program with uh, um, an English uh, drug expert, and what she was saying is that uh, you know, now one in nine uh, you know citizens of the UK uh, are either addicted or have uh, some sort of dependence on uh, you know. Uh, on addictive substances of various kinds. And the worst part is that these substances now change so so rapidly that it's almost impossible to control them. Mm. Well, okay, we'll open up for, for questions and uh, someone can take my mic around if there's anything anybody wants to ask. Oh, there's lots of hands up here. Yeah. I was um, interested in what you were saying about them, the British creating a market in China or forcing sales of opium on them when they were growing opium in India, what, uh, what steps were taken to either promote the sale of opium in India or to restrict it? Uh, that's an interesting question because as uh, 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 you know, anti-opium sentiment grew inside India as well as in Britain. They would regularly, uh, they would regu regularly create, uh, you know, all 
systems that were meant to restrict uh, the circulation of opium. But in fact, you know, the opium department had its own opium outlets uh, inside India, and these outlets were meant to be profit-making. So even when restrictions were imposed, uh, you know, their local opium agents found ways, uh, ways around them and continued to market opium on a very large scale. So, you know, this, this also happened in the Dutch East Indies. So they created various, as they call them, opium regime, uh, you know, regimes, uh, as it were. But uh, in, in fact, once you uh, set up a system which is meant to earn you revenue, it becomes impossible to, uh, you know, to actually restrict that source of revenue. Thank you. Um, I like to imagine that you uh, have done so much historical research for the IBIS trilogy and that has kind of fed into smoke and ashes, but I suppose my question is about the difference between fiction and non-fiction and where you draw the line, like how much you put your research into your fiction and then how much you would hold back for a non-fiction book because I'm speaking as someone who loves learning history from fiction. You know, um, I did an enormous amount of research for the IBIS trilogy because, uh, you know, some of, these, uh, some, of the, uh, some of the histories that figure in the IBIS trilogy aren't actually, you know, you can't find history books about them. L like there exists no real military history of the, uh, not in English anyway, uh, of the first opium war. So I had to reconstruct all those battles for myself. I had to reconstruct all the military, you know, activities um, based on primary sources, you know. So there was an enormous amount of research that I did. But the great thing about writing a novel is that even when you're writing about something very, very dark, uh, you can make it fun for yourself, <laughs> you know, in one way or the other. Uh, you know, your characters are doing things, you know, they're human beings, they, uh, they enjoy things and so on. And that was very important for me, and it made it, made it possible for me to write, uh, uh, you know, the Ibis trilogy, which was really about terribly dark things like the indenture, uh, like, um, you know, the opium trade and so on. Uh, and when I finished it, I had this enormous amount of uh, material on my hands, and I thought, well, my wife encouraged me, she said, you should write, uh, you know, you should put all that material together. Uh, and in fact, I got a. I, th I thought, okay, maybe I should do it. And I, uh, my agent, who is here today, uh, got me a contract for a book. And I thought, well, you know, I'll, I, and I started writing it. And I, you know, I had a go. I wrote, uh, you know, a lot of it, like maybe half. And then I thought, no, I just can't do this. I hate this. I hate writing this. It's so horrible. It's a story without anything redeeming in it. Uh, and I, I cancelled my contract. <laughs> and I, I returned all the money and I thought, I'm done with that, thank God. But then, eventually I came back to it, you know, because I think there are so many parallels with the climate crisis and as you were saying, with uh, extractive industries and so on. And I, th that made me feel that this is a story that needs to be told. And, uh, you know, since I'd been working on it for so long, I felt I'm, I'm just as good a person to tell this story as anyone else. Um, I was really excited about your approach to the entanglements of history and how you're, you're knitting up all of those different storylines, if you like, all that you know about the British Empire, about the opium trade, and about, obviously, you know, other, other things that go on, and how it relates to the, the, the sort of entanglements that we currently have. And I think that your gift as a storyteller is really important, that you're, knitting, you're able to knit those things together in a way that is intriguing and entrancing in, in, in for a general reader as well as people who know about the sort of histories and are interested in those sort of... I'm sorry, I can't see you, which is a rather odd feeling, so... <laughs> <laughs> yes. Go ahead, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I didn't hear the last bit. Yeah. Oh. Did, did I? Just, just the last bit. Huh? 
Oh, no, it was just sort of very, you know, it was fascinating how you can begin to tell stories, how you can use your storytelling sort of genius, if you like, to bring together those entanglements and to actually knit together, uh, you know, the, those stories. And I think that in this, in this era of, you know, post-colonialism, well, we have to examine ourselves and the, the, the places that we live in. I just think it's, it's really wonderful that you are able to do that. That's very kind of you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. And then we'll come to you next. So one thing I was uh, struck by reading your book, your wonderful book, was that it can be read through many lenses. And one of the lenses I was reading it uh, was the decolonization lens. And I come from India where there's a lot of talk about decolonizing yourself all the time in service of uh, you know, right-wing majoritarianism. So I'm just curious as to what your thoughts are, are on the whole subject of decolonization, which probably runs through many, it's a theme that seems to run through many of your books. Yeah, it's a strange thing because, uh, you know, I've, I've been thinking about colonialism and, uh, you know, when you think about colonialism, you have to think about decolonization as well. But the instrumentalization of decolonization or decolonial thought in service of majoritarianism is something I find absolutely repellent. It really disturbs me and I think it uh, misrepresents everything and uh, uh, it's creating all these uh, bizarre uh, right-wing narratives uh, in India. So I don't want to have any truck with that. At the same time, uh, you know, I, I don't think in my book, in this one, you'll ever see the word decolon <laughs> decolonial or anything like that. So I generally try to steer clear of that jargon while trying to, you know, as it were, tell the story as best I can. Yes, you mentioned that the opium poppy doesn't occur naturally. Uh, it had to be developed. And also that there's evidence of usage of opium for thousands of years. When and where and what were the first evidences? Oh, there's a lot of archaeological evidence. Uh, some of it, uh, you know, opium's been found in uh, Egyptian graves, for example. Uh, there are Egyptian treatises on it. But I think one of the earliest instances of opium actually comes from, uh, uh, from a, a Neolithic site in Switzerland. Uh, yes. The farmer industry. <laughs> yeah. There you are. <laughs> Early beginnings. <laughs> uh, it was grown in Switzerland. Uh, you know, yeah. I mean, in what is now Switzerland, of course, it was in Switzerland then. But, you know, it's also mentioned by Pliny, it's mentioned by, you know, a whole host of... Hello, thank you for a um, wonderful paper. Um, I, I have really a comment that's kind of a footnote to the two parts of your paper, which was the first one about uh, plants and botany, uh, and the second one about opium. And, and in that, I've been doing some research on William Kerr. Oh, really? And, um, and also on Ahe, the Chinese gardener. Ah, wonderful. Uh, and a new source on him. Um, but, but just to tie the two parts of the, your presentation together, it's, it's rather than dying of a broken heart, William Kerr, I believe, and the implication is he died of opium addiction. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm. Wow. Yeah. So it does, does, it does bind the two narratives together. How interesting. I thought he was an alcoholic. Well, it's not clear. They says he, he kind of, he picks up kind of bad habits and, and, and um, so in the, in the report of his death, I think you, you showed a, an image talking about a, 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 there is a, a newspaper account of it. And, it, and it's like it, he, put, he, he, he picked up habits from the natives, that kind of thing. And we don't explicitly say what's going on. It has been assumed, I think, it was opium related. Anyway, uh, it could but be but he, he did. Uh he, he, he did move to Candy, right? Yeah, the yeah, he, did. He, he got, he got, he, he got appointed yeah. to, um, <laughs> to, 
to run a botanic garden and then it then there was a sad demise. Uh, please tell us the story of Afe. I mean, I would love to hear it and I'm sure everyone else would as well. So uh, Afe is, um, this goes back to the Joseph Banks um, period. Why don't you stand up so everyone can see you? <laughs> so Afe um, is a young gardener, possibly a boy. Um, so it goes back to the Joseph Banks period when Banks is really interested in bringing over the, the, the Chinese flora. He wants to get his hands on everything that he can. He sends out William Kerr. Um, and um, it, it's really the idea that it, it, the difficulty of bringing back live plants on board a ship on that long voyage, how do you keep them alive? So Banks has had various solutions before involving gardeners sent out from Kew to accompany um, boatloads back. He, he has designed things called plant cabins uh, for on board the deck to put the plants inside. Um, but for the first time um, in China, because the Chinese are so associated with gardens in his mind, I think, um, he asks for a Chinese gardener to accompany the, um, a, a boatload, uh, a cabin load of, of, of plants back to Kew. Um, and and uh, so a young boy is found, and he um, he has to be smuggled on board because it is illegal uh, to, for for you know uh, for a Chinese person to go uh, abroad. So he's kind of smuggled abroad. Uh, there's a wonderful account of his kind of the way he leaves, like his clothes are sent in one trunk, and then he you know through lots of diverse means he gets on board. He, and he goes. Get, I think he probably gets on board at, um, is it Lintin, Lintin where all yeah. the opium stuff happens. So he's sort of smuggled on board and he comes to Kew and he spends six months um, at Kew um, before he can get a return a voyage back with another plant load of um, kind of mm. fairly common garden plants from Kew that are going back to... Um, Sweeten up the Hong merchants, the, the very grand merchants, Chinese merchants who control the whole industry. So, so it's, about, it's about kind of plant exchange uh, at mm. that time, but it's really to accompany a cabin load of plants. And anyhow, so it's really intriguing what he might have done whilst at Kew. Um, I thought he was a, kind of a sensation and people would come to see him. No, I think that's, um, no, I think that's more to do with the painters who came. Oh, okay. So I think so. He's just he's just a young boy. Yeah. Um, and but I think at one point he does actually go around the Chinese plants queue and writes a list because we have a reference to. So he's kind of annotating in a nice act, reverse act of kind of categorization and cataloging. He's Fascinating. Yes. So what was the new source you found? Because I tried <laughs> and I couldn't find any. Oh well, you'll have to read. You'll have to read my article, Amita. <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming. Um, that was fantastic, Amitav. That Thank was a real gallop and canter through um, an awful lot of wonderful history. And you are an extraordinary writer, and I feel very privileged that we're here in the room with you tonight. And thank you again to Louise Willows for the support from Rathbones, and thank you, Alex, and all the crew here at Kew. It's an absolute pleasure to do things. Do tune in in a couple of weeks, To We have another one in our series. Um, we're looking actually further into colonialism with Andrea Wolfe and Sathnav Sangira, whose name I can never get right, who really have written a lot about the way plants traded and plants moved and we're going to be doing a, an online seminar so um, books available outside and you will be signing them and if for anyone who hasn't read the Sea of Poppies trilogy the Ibis trilogy I cannot recommend it too highly it is I learnt more from that book than I, I think from any other. And I, I Thank love you. learning um, history through fiction too, especially when it's fiction like that. So it's great that you're here. Congratulations on the book. And Thank you so much. Long may you keep writing. Thank you. Thank you so much.